Hello everybody, welcome back to 19 Cats and Counting. If you are a cat lover, you have probably experienced that time when your cat is ill, you know they're going to pass, or suddenly you need to euthanize them, and we all know the number it does on us and how difficult it is, and we have someone here today, she is the president-elect, will become the president in January of the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care, and she has got such great information. If you've got a kitty or going to get a kitty, you're not going to want to miss this. We'll be right back after the sponsored ad. Welcome back everybody to 19 Cats and Counting. I am so excited today because I have a background in hospice. I worked as a CNA for human hospice and I had hospice in my home for my husband when he passed in 2002. I know how valuable it is. I didn't know that cat hospice existed. I didn't either. I, Rita, were you, right? Rita, you've been involved in cats how many years and we didn't know about this. Lot, how did we not know many, about this? Many years. I could have really use their help um for those of you counting i'm no longer 19 cats and counting i'm 18 cats and counting because i lost yeah. my dear dash just last week um yes i really could have used some help and perhaps um some of the services that dr agner offers yes so let's get to introducing we have here dr diane agner she is dr diane agner vmd mbac VPMCHPV. So we know she's very smart. A, B, C, D, F, G. So we know she's very smart. And she also has a business called The Cat Whisperer with three R's. And she even has named her boat The Perfect. So we knew right away she was our kind of lady. So welcome, Dr. Diane. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're so excited. So how did you get involved in this? in hospice and palliative care yes so probably my hard cat um, is a sphinx cat that i rescued now back more than 10 years ago and i think it was in about 2014 she was diagnosed with pancreatitis and her kidneys were very compromised as well and it was a very very poor prognosis but I committed myself to supporting her and basically provided her with hospice and palliative care. And throughout that experience, I just kept coming back to how lucky I was to be a veterinarian. That I was empowered to do what I did, you know, and, and you know, somebody could have told me if I was an owner that your cat has a terminal. Oh, excuse me, that's my puppy. Is everybody okay? <laughs> We are getting a bit of background noise from you too. This is how this is how it is when we live with animals, right? right. Yeah, especially a new little four-month-old puppy. So, um, so I just remember thinking about that. You know how lucky I was that I was empowered to do what I did for her, and I kept her going for almost a year. Um, and um, and 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 I thought about how much I'd like to give that gift um, to other owners of cats that were given a terminal diagnosis. And I was reaching a point that I was getting ready to sell a practice that I've established in Philadelphia and I've owned it for over 30 years, almost 35 years, um, and wasn't quite ready to stop practicing veterinary medicine. I just sure. knew that I didn't want to own the business anymore. So I thought that I'd come down here to the Jersey Shore and limit what I did to hospice and palliative care and in-home euthanasia, um, and that's kind of what I've done. Hey, can, I inter can I interrupt for a minute? And, and, um, yes. Mark can edit this out. We're getting a lot of background noise from you. Is there a fan running nearby or something? Oh, it might be the air conditioner. Let me just see. Oh, I'm we don't want to make you her. cook. <laughs> see if the noise goes away. It's louder now. Ooh, wait, there we go. Oh, there we go. Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. That we don't want to make you cook. Now she starts make sweating. Mark really happy. Okay. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah. So between Rita and I, we've we've had plenty of these experiences, and you know, I know when my husband was terminal, they had people coming to check on him. Um, they gave us um, shots, intravena or intramuscular injections that we could give him for pain. You know, I had all this support, but I I told you about my cat Latte. You know, I, I took her in. She had cancer. It was a very fast growing cancer that had taken over so much they couldn't just. It was on her hip. They couldn't just remove the. I mean, we were just done. So they all offered to euthanize her right there and then but 
I felt like she still had a lot of life in her and I didn't want to cheat her out of. And us. I mean, we loved this cat. Right. So basically, we just went home to do it on our own until it was time. You know, no pain meds, no nobody checking in, you know. So you do like virtual assessments, right? And you can assess and support that way. Tell me, tell me what you would have done for me if I had come to you with my latte situation. Well, I, if you were nearby, then I would have come and done an initial intake visit where you would have completed a pretty um, robust questionnaire that helped me understand you and your cat better. Mm -hmm. And then together, after I did a physical exam, we would come up with a plan. And so, in your cat's case, if pain was one of the things that we'd be concerned about, then I would be prescribing medications, and either that would be in the you know oral form that you'd be administering, or possibly in injections, provided you told me you were capable of giving injections, mm -hmm. and and then we would set up regular timing in terms of how much we'd be communicating, and you would help guide me as to you know, whether I'd be coming back for assessments. And some of that might depend a little bit about your budget, right? Because we need right. to keep that in mind. That's always a significant part of plan. It has, you know, it, there is a reality of that in um, veterinary medicine. You offer people assistance that aren't in your area. Like you couldn't come to actually do the euthanasia, but they maybe need some counseling making the decision. Yeah, well, there's very strict rules. Um, in the Practice Act in every state limits what you're allowed to do through a virtual connection. Okay. Now, with COVID, some of that was relaxed. And right. there's a lot of work being done to create a situation where I would be allowed to do an exam, an exam, you know, right. if it, yes. if it, um, oral, you know, an oral discussion exam, um, and that I would be allowed to prescribe. And I think New Jersey did pass a law that allows me to prescribe now. I'm limited. Is that your beautiful dog? We love you. <laughs> I hear that, yeah. Playing in her little pet cave. Um, so, you know, that, that I am allowed to prescribe. I'm limited in New Jersey. I'm pretty sure that I'm not allowed to prescribe controlled substances. Right. But I believe Michigan passed a law recently or changed their practice act that you can do both through a virtual telehealth communication. And there is now an you know, association that's been established 100% to back this movement and to try to work with the states to be able to provide this kind of service mm -hmm. through a, a what we call a virtual visit. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. You know, and we all deal with... I know, uh, you know, we talked about when I, my last trip to South Carolina, yeah, Rita's lovey. lovey was not doing well and had cancer. And, you know, she second guessed herself a lot when we talked. And I think everybody does, you know, is it time? Is it not time? Am I cheating him out of something? Because he am seemed I saving happy him and he pain, was eating. Right? But I knew it was time. But when you came and you saw it, because I saw it gradually happen, you saw the difference immediately and you knew it was time. Well, yes, that's, you know, that's a service that um, I do offer working for a Blue Pearl um, hospice division of their business where mm -hmm. I do virtual quality of life assessments. Okay, yeah, to, that's to, great. To exactly help people that are trying to figure out when, when it's going to be time. You know, so that would have helped me and Linda and Latte. Yes, sure. and we all know that cats hide signs of illnesses, right? Indeed. So my cat was not whining or crying or complaining. How do I know if he, but you know, by the time the tumor gets this big, you just have to assume there's some pain involved somewhere. And, you know, and then you feel selfish. And, you know, I, I waited until, by the time it became apparent I needed to do something, we were really in a situation where Latte was definitely suffering. It was so an then emergency. I'm rushing around. Yeah. And I'm rushing around trying to find somebody to help him. And I'm sitting there, you know, I kept you too long. I know I kept you too long. I'm so sorry I made you suffer. But knowing where that line is, I think is huge. Huge. And that's something that, you know, we need that medical background as much as we know about cats. Mm -hmm. We need that medical background to say, okay, if the tumor's gone this size, it's definitely hitting here. It's definitely, you know, what's going on that we don't understand that's going on underneath. And so I know that would cats be... also, they have certain facial expressions that maybe we're not, we don't pick up. You know, there's that grimace factor that uh, Sylvester AI uses to 
tell you if yes. your cat's happy or not. And um, didn't you take one of your cats to the vet based on on the, that? I did. Yes, we got approached by some people. Have you heard of this, Doctor Eigner, the Happy or Not app with um, Sylvester AI created? The Tablet app. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's that you take the picture and, and then, yes, yeah, the tablet, yes. They came to us and we had them on our podcast, so we got to be the first ones to try out the app, and it kept saying my cat was not happy. And, of course, you know, okay, he's mad about something, but then he was laying behind me as I was taking my face off, and we were rubbing on each other and having a moment, and we were purring at each other and just in love. So I thought, okay, click unhappy. Wait a minute, what's going on? So I took him to the vet and it turned out he had a lot of inflammation. He was dehydrated. They had to give him some meds and some sub-Q fluids. I never would have known. <laughs> I bet, Dr. Diane, you would have picked that up. You know, if, you, if you'd done a, call, a virtual call with her, you probably would have seen it because you are more experienced with end of life than we are. Yeah, pro probably, but I have to give owners a lot of credit that... Um, if they're taught to just pay attention, you know, mm -hmm. to things like how a cat sleeps, the posture that they get into, and just mm -hmm. get, you know, it, it, there's a lot of stuff that happens when we own our pets that is kind of subconscious, like, you know, it, 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 we're not really recognizing that it's registering. Right. But that's, that's, I think, one of the most important things that a pet owner can do in being an advocate for their cat or their dog is to make sure that they recognize patterns in, in, in cats. The subtle signs are often related to things like where they're sleeping and, and um, you know, activity levels, think, you know, normal things that they are doing. And when there's a change, I think that's when you want to perk up and realize, wait a second, something's going on here. Yeah, they're acting differently, and yeah, and that can be hard. You know, this happened with Kismet shortly after my daughter moved in with her four cats. So I really wasn't, I really wasn't attributing small changes as to being a part of a medical issue because we had just had a major life change, right. and I know that affects cats' behavior. So yeah, he wasn't spending as much time in the bedroom, but I just yeah, I attributed that to the household shakeup. So uh, what kind of things do you look for? What signals to you that there might be pain going on? Well, that, that what you mentioned about tablet, it's based on facial expression. So mm -hmm. if your listeners want to Google the feline grimace scale, that's a validated pain scale. I think most of the work was done up in Canada at one of the veterinary schools there. Um, so it's actually the position of the head in relation to the shoulders. It actually is the position of the whiskers, the position of the ears. It's a composite scale. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's where you can recognize pain from the facial expression. But again, I go back to posture, and um, Zoetis just updated their website. I think it's called the Science of OA, Science of Osteoarthritis, where there's mm -hmm. um, fabulous videos that your listeners can access. That we'll check that out. Allow them to watch how cats um, get up and down stairs and. Um, how they normally should launch themselves off of a high surface, not hesitate. And things like that are very subtle signs that owners might dismiss. Mm -hmm. You know, they might not even think about. But when they watch these videos, they might say, oh, my God, my cat is doing that. And it doesn't mean that your cat is in, you know, horrible, horrible discomfort. But it's worth figuring it out. It's worth, you know, bringing that to your veterinarian's attention. And since... I think it's something like 80%, maybe even 90% of cats over 10 years old have osteoarthritis. Right. If, if there's even a question, the odds are that the cat has a level of discomfort that's worth trying to alleviate. Well, that's true. The two 15-year-olds I recently adopted, they do walk differently than the younger cats. And I'm sure they're experiencing some sort of arthritic pain because of their age. Yeah, they often move their feet like they kind of bunny hop sometimes down the stairs. It's, mm -hmm. it's different than a normal cat. Smoochy. So Rita's got oh, a tripod. Right. Rita's got a tripod. Yeah. And my son-in-law was diabetic, and he had to have his toes amputated and experienced horrible ghost pains. And it started me thinking, and I told Rita, because Smoochie has a problem with litter box usage when it's raining. It does. And I said, 
I'll bet you she feels ghost pains. I mean, if people feel it, why shouldn't cats? And I know Sebastian is a tough old bird. He didn't complain much, but oh, his face would grimace. And I'd say, what's our, just, just my toe pain. And I'd say, you know, what, what's happening? And just feels like someone's sawing off my toes. Nothing serious, you know? And I just, I felt so badly for him. And then I thought, what are we missing in, for example, Smoochie? And Smoochie's a bunny hopper. When you said that, I thought, she oh, is. yes. Well, she's got one back leg missing. So that's part of why she hops. But when it's raining, she does get a little bit grumpy. So I'm guessing that um, is maybe making her ghost pain flare up or maybe just the other legs that she's got to support herself on three legs and she's not a little cat. Maybe the other legs just have some issues because they're supporting her weight. I was going to say, you know, we often do have that happen where if you think about it, if the way the body's designed, the Mm -hmm. weight's supposed to be distributed on all four legs evenly and equally. So if one of those legs is no longer able to carry the load, there's a disproportionate amount of weight that's then carried on the so other I was right. <laughs> Could be developing arthritis. Oh, or, we have to take so, a little pause. Okay, good, because I want to talk about euthanasia. And I was just going to say, oh, do we need right. a break first before we I launch into this? All right. We'll All take right. a little break and we'll be right back. And we're back with 19 cats and counting, Linda and Dr. Diane. What is our next, what is the next thing we wanted to discuss? Linda has a topic. Euthanasia. So euthanasia is horrible. We all know it's a horrible, horrible experience. Nobody left euthanasia going, that was great. But, you know, there are ways to make it easier. There are. Um, So we were talking about uh, our experience. Um, We do not have anyone in my area that will come and do these in home, which I know you do, Dr. Diane. But also we talked about how you do it. And that was like everything to me mind-blowing. I was talking about it last night to my family. So explain how you go about this. Well, the most important thing is to make sure that the experience is satisfying for the pet and and for the owner, and it really honors the human-animal bond. So Mm -hmm. we would, I would never consider separating the pet from the owner, which is something that does still sometimes unfortunately happen um, in veterinary clinics, you know, what we call brick and mortar facilities. Yes. So that's the number one thing that that the pet would stay, the cat especially, um, would stay with you. And then another thing that is commonly done, um, which initially was thought to be a best practice, was to place an intravenous catheter. And this was because some veterinarians were concerned about whether or not they could give the injection and finish giving the injection. You know, veins can blow, and especially in fragile pets that are near the end of their lives. And so a catheter makes the veterinarian feel much more comfortable that that's not going to happen. But many people aren't that confident with their venipuncture skills, the fancy words for saying getting into the vein. So they, oftentimes the pet was whisked away to the back, you know, to put the catheter in. Um, and then the cat would be that. brought back. So, so that's something that I would never do, and we're working very hard, the IHPC, to get the word out that that's not something that we want to happen. Mm-hmm. In my case, I use um, a three-injection technique, and I ask ahead of time for my owners to pick a place in the house or the backyard that is special for the cat. When I come in, I you know once the everybody's settled and ready for me to begin, I'll give a sedative that just takes the edge off the cat. And then what we discussed, Linda, is that I don't actually use the vein when I give the euthanasia solution. I actually use what we call an interorgan technique, where I go directly, in my case, into the kidney. And in order to do that, if you're following the AVMA's euthanasia guidelines, you must anesthetize your patient, not just sedate. So in addition to that first sedative I give, I then follow that with a dose of medication that anesthetizes the pet. So they don't feel the needle going in. They don't feel anything. That's right. Um, And so you want no sensation. You want a loss of consciousness, but you also want no ability to feel anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And then only after that has taken full effect do I follow with the final injection of the euthanasia solution. And that technique is something, again, that we're trying to teach veterinary students about as well as practicing veterinarians because 
the majority of veterinarians today still don't realize that you don't need a vein, you know? Um, yeah. As we're talking ways. about this, I'm just picturing all the euthanasias I've done and I just... <laughs> I'm trying not to cry. It's just so heartbreaking. Me too. Thank you for saying that because, yeah, my eyes were filling up. And I thought, don't do it. Don't do it. But, yeah, you know, I, I did have one experience where they took them into the back room, like you said. Um, that was latte. Like I said, it was an emergency, and I was calling every vet saying, who can get this, get this cat in to fix this problem? And so it was a vet that I hadn't used. And, yeah, when they said they wanted to take her into the back room, I'm freaking out because, yeah, cat, cat doesn't want to be in the carrier. Cat does not want to be in the vet's office with all these strange sounds and smells and sights and smelling dogs and what have you and then to take her away from me and take her into a back room I, I just was like no why why do you have to do that you know please don't do that and then even uh, my regular vet does not do that we'll do it all right there but even then they have to put the cat on the table so you know I'm leaning over on the cat and loving on the cat while it's happening but picturing just holding the cat from start to finish in my arms and letting them die that way is gift. just it's such a gift. It's so much better, I think, for the cat and for me. You know, even if I had to take it into the vet, which I prefer the home deal, but still, if I get to hold the cat from start to finish, at least he's, he's going to be with mom, right? He's going to feel that comfort, and I'm going to feel it. Well, I think that's why people sometimes question veterinarians that focus on end-of-life work. They question how we can do it, and um, what you said is why we could do it, and because it's kind of like what you said, Rita. I mean, we really do feel the gift. So, do you have a program where veterinarians can learn these techniques? So, perhaps we have uh, veterinarians out there that are more um, skilled at the proper way to do euthanasia. Well, probably the industry leader is Dr. Kathy Cooney, who runs the Companion. Animal Euthanasia Training Academy. Mm -hmm. She now has developed a virtual curriculum so that you don't have to travel to attend one of her courses, which are often coordinated with a major veterinary conference. Nice. We want that hands-on experience now that COVID rules are loosening up. Right. There are going to be opportunities if you, let's say, you wanted to practice those inter-organ techniques that I mentioned. So Kathy is a leader, um, so her material is fabulous, and so I would highly recommend they check her out. And then the International Association of Hospice and Palliative Care, um, we offer a certification program that covers full-blown hospice and palliative care, um, and one of our modules uses Kathy's curriculum for euthanasia mm -hmm. training. And then something I'm proud of is I was fortunate to be able to get University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School, my alma mater, to allow me to bring in an elective using the IAAHPC's part of their curriculum so that now junior students for the last almost five years, it's definitely four years now, have been given the opportunity to choose an elective in their junior year so that they can explore the whole euthanasia experience, which believe it or not, is not traditionally part of the core curriculum that veterinary students get, even though oftentimes day one, they walk out of school, their first day of their job, and that's something they have to do. Yes, I'm sure that's quite a frequent thing. I know just between us, because, you know, see as we have multi multi cat households we see it a lot more often you know it's it's a numbers game unfortunately you i know, lost but... two this year within six months from the same yeah year, both 11 yeah. years old too young but you uh, know offering somebody a, a peaceful you know it's so stressful for the cat to put them in a carrier drive them to the vet's office and they have to go on the back and have a needle shoved in their leg you know so by the time you get to the euthanasia they're already all riled up you want it to be a peaceful transition, and, and that's what you guys are offering. Yeah, yeah. So we, we love our hospice for humans for that reason. You know, it, it, it gives the family comfort as well as the patient and allows this to happen in a, in a more natural setting. I was able to keep my husband home and let him pass here, and that was such a huge gift. And the fact that you are addressing this for our animals is just huge because that was everything and I know the questions we ask you know as they're getting sicker you know I don't know is it getting worse should I be doing this should I be doing that when do I draw the line when is it enough everybody second guesses themselves did I wait too long or am I pulling the plug too quickly so yeah 
how do you how do you guard yourself against compassion fatigue dr diane well you, you, you clearly want to be in a position where you're feeling you're helping the pet so i don't i don't think you can guard yourself a hundred percent um in in any of these situations because it's almost it's like a little piece of you dies every time a sure. pet you help is passing um but I think one, you know, really believing in what you're doing helps. Mm -hmm. um, working with owners that are not electively euthanizing, and it sounds weird because they are choosing to euthanize, but, but it's, you know, it's because the cat really needs um, to peacefully pass on. Um, and then, to be honest, you have to really carefully set boundaries. Um, and so when I mentioned what I've just mentioned in regards to who you're providing services for, not to decline services to people because you want to be nasty, but um, you have to just have terms that you have agreed you're going to follow and follow your own ethical compass and moral compass, um, and, and then set those boundaries. Because, because veterinarian, one veterinarian can't help all these cats out there that are going to need help, right? So um, you have to just not allow yourself to feel responsible when, when you someone you or a cat yeah that that's the hard part and we see this with behavior you know we've had people you know if you can't fix this in this set time period we're giving up the cat and we've had people say they were going to euthanize the cat well peeing is not a reason another to one euthanize today. your cat you got another and one today. yes yes another one wrote in today and we've got they've got multiple problems that i believe are all rooted in anxiety because new ones keep sprouting up and now they're doing this and uh and they're you know they're on the edge and they're they're frustrated and I understand that, but you know, they're ready to give up the cat. Well, we can't keep taking in all these cats. Oh, look, <laughs> who's, oh, who's, look. Who's crawling up. <laughs> look how sweet. Tell us who this is. Oh, this is Blue. This is my oh, rest. My Hi, baby. Oh, Beautiful. So sweet. <laughs> Aww. Heart Sphinx are very sweet kitties. Do you ever get yeah. people wanting you to euthanize for behavioral issues versus illness? And how do you handle that if they do? Well, I think that's the number one reason that cats are relinquished to shelters and mm -hmm. rehomed. Um, so I was in a position since I owned a hospital that I could set a policy and we wouldn't do it unless God. we had thoroughly worked up the case and tried everything that we felt was appropriate, including often having that owner work with a behaviorist at the university nearby. So the only cases that were really extreme would that even get, you know, possibly booked with us. And I, I honestly can't think of any time but I've done that because instead, um, if it really became obvious the cat had worn out its welcome, we would often work with local farms and, and you know, a factory and try to find a place for that cat to go out and live the rest of its life. Um, and if it, you know, it just couldn't be reprogrammed to use the litter box, then let it become an outdoor cat. And a, you know, a neutered outdoor cat, male or female, is going to stay pretty close to, let's say, the barn right. um, or in a factory setting would even be indoors. Um, and so that would be another option. It may, it may not mean, of course, that that, pet could, that cat could stay in the home, mm -hmm. but it would mean the cat could continue to live its life. Yeah, it's, yeah. Better, it's a better choice than euthanizing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I agree. To me, euthanasia is just for medical end of life transitions it's really yes. not for i want to give this cat up because he doesn't behave and what i'd yes. even you know i'd even consider having you know they have heated outdoor cat houses mm -hmm. that i've even talked to owners about transitioning the cat to being an outdoor cat and of course you want that owner to still engage with that cat so sure. you don't want that cat to not again have that human animal bond that they've gotten used to but um try to think outside the box for solutions that don't include euthanasia Yes. Yeah. I know a lot of badly behaved adults and we don't just kill them off. Right. Like <laughs> yeah. we threaten, but no, I'm just but kidding. Don't get me started. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. Is there anything Dr. Diane, you want our listeners to know that we haven't already covered? I think the the thing that I'm really passionate about is um, sort of Linda, what you brought up is that when, 
when you unfortunately find yourself in a situation where your cat is diagnosed with a terminal condition, um, do you have a conversation that focuses on is there a possibility that you can provide comfort care? And ask your veterinarian if they can provide that or a referral to someone who can. Um, and you have the right to design this experience that's going to be the final stage of your cat's life. So just like Linda, you chose to keep your cat at home. You know, unfortunately, you had to sort it out on your own. There are enough veterinarians out there nationwide that are providing hospital palliative care. And if you're not finding your veterinarian is open to that, um, then be advocating for your cat. And recognize that with COVID-19, our veterinarians are working 24-7, they're exhausted. The average veterinarian does not have an hour to do a consultation with you right. like I do with owners. So again, you know, recognize the limitations, especially in a brick and mortar situation in a physical practice environment. But, you know, ask, inquire about the availability of an in-home consultation with a particular hospice and family care provider. You can always go to our website, the International Association of Hospice and Palliative Care, to check out members that are in your geographic area. And we'll put those we'll put those websites in uh, the write up about the show. So yes, uh, when people go to link, listen yes. or view, they'll be able to have those resources right there. Yeah, I'll make sure too. I get back to you with the directory for in home euthanasia, but you may you may already have that link. But just to make sure you can share that with your please. Thank Absolutely. you. That would be wonderful. Yes, please, because I I know. You know, just in our personal experiences, and, you know, we've all had these experiences. If you've got a cat, this is either hit you or is going to hit you. And I just think this is so important to making things easier in the process. It's heartbreaking enough to lose your cat. Right. But how nice to be able to have it peaceful and loving and, and not feel like your cat is being ripped away from you to have these procedures done, even in the best settings. Oh, yeah. I remember once um, I had to euthanize a cat. And um, Richard, Richard Simmons, we both used to work for Richard. Uh, he called me, I called him, because he's a, he's a big animal lover. And he told me, go get the cat and get her, bring her home and let her die at home. But the vet wouldn't let me take her home. I had to euthanize her right there. Well, that really wasn't that veterinarian's mm -hmm. choice to be. It was made. heartbreaking. Exactly. I was going to say, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fight you. Watch me on my way out. Yes, hopefully he's evolved a little bit because that was yeah, it was when you were living in LA, so it's been a little while. But yeah, no, no it was here. It was here. It was oh, actually it was here. before I moved to LA. Oh, yeah, okay. That's where you just we just have to hope that um, with the growth of the hospice and palliative care movement that you could have that conversation and say, please, I, I'm I'm not asking you to make my cat suffer. I'm asking you provide me with medications that could keep my cat comfortable at home but i want my cat to pass at home mm -hmm. yes yeah i think it's easier on the other cats too um i noticed when i i had warren after his stroke euthanized at the vet's office but i brought him back waiting for my husband because my husband is the um grave digger in our house for it back and um so i had worn in a box and the cats came around and all sniffed him and it it felt to me like they were saying their goodbyes it was really an they, awful touching heartwarming nice moment it they was did very that confusing when, they did that when dash died at home last week too yeah Cats yeah came up and kind of said goodbye and don't you think that that helps the cats to understand you know your cat just disappears and never comes back where's the cat as opposed to them smelling that death scent am i right i don't know that i know that that's been documented through behaviors it's actually it's interesting you're bringing this up because i have a girlfriend who is a feline behavior specialist boarded in feline medicine and she's going to be giving a lecture um it's part of the curriculum that we have for our certification students and i'm hoping she's going to be bringing in some evidence-based information about that you know exactly that do do cats recognize when um a cat right. in group um is failing and what you just said in terms of that closure that we anthropomorphize and think they're having that closure but i can't speak to it right. or 
print a journal article, so I'm sorry if I can't answer that question as confidently <laughs> as I'd like to. Well, uh, no, no but, that's fine. But anecdotally, from what you've witnessed, I, I have a feeling that you think that's probably true. We would love to have her on our show. Yes, yes, we'd love to speak to her. Yeah, I, you know, I just... I know that they know when someone's missing and, and I know that their sense of smell is crazy strong and I know there's a smell to death. CNA here worked a lot with hospice. Um, so I just wonder if that gives them the clue of what just happened and, you know, they weren't messing with Warren. They weren't trying to smack him, wake him up, engage with him. They were just sniffing him and super marked the box all the way around and it just it felt like a moment to me it's one of those moments where you wish you had a translator that could yeah. you know explain what their thoughts but it felt that way it felt very reverent to me in the way she was behaving towards the box and so I even opened it up and and let her really sniff him and yeah she didn't she was just intent on really checking it out and making that connection it felt so yeah we unfortunately have gone over, so we've got to yes. wrap it up. We probably could talk yes. for a whole nother hour. With oh, you. we could. Well, we can't thank you enough, Dr. Diane, because what you're doing is just really, really life-changing for people who love their animals and you being a part in it and and, and uh, starting a business to help people and becoming a part of the IIH, where am I? <laughs> IAAH. PC. Yes, that's a lot of letters. Ah, uh, yes. And so that is that is just huge because we need to get the word out everywhere so that we can all have better experiences with our passings and feel better about them. Agreed. Agreed. Thank yes. you so much. And um, I so appreciate you being on the show. Uh, my co-host with the most is Linda Hall. And of course, Mark Winter, who does an awesome job editing our show and getting it ready for everyone, and who gave us a chance on Pet Life Radio. We really appreciate it. Remember, every day is Catter Day. <laughs>